Professor Dan Ariely, who's an economist, so he has a famous study that he did where at the end of the study he coined a term called the IKEA effect. What's the IKEA effect? So he noticed that when people go to IKEA and uh, they come home with like three little boxes, and from those three little boxes you're gonna end up having a whole bookshelf and a chair and, uh, and a dresser or something like that, then you built the whole thing yourself. There's a famous comic about a guy who goes to Ikea for an interview, and he walks in and on the floor, there's just like a few screws and a few boards, and the boss says to him, here, build yourself a chair and sit down. So that's the way it works in Ikea, that, uh, so people come home, they bring home these boxes, they build everything themselves, but then afterwards, they overvalue what it is that they built. They think that what they built is like the greatest thing ever. And if they have a choice between some high-end furniture and the bookshelf, which is made on a cheap particle board that they built themselves, they think that their board is great. Why? Because of all the effort that they put into it. So he called this the IKEA effect. The idea being that when you put effort into something, you tend to think that it's worth more than it really is. They took a bunch of college students, they did a bunch of experiments. One of the experiments was they taught them how to do origami. So they sit down, they give them a piece of paper, fold it this way, fold it that way, and they made a paper frog. They then say, okay, fine, thank you very much for participating. We need the frog for uh, the next guy. And, oh, you want to hold on to it? How much would you be willing to pay for it? So, on average, people said a quarter. They took these same frogs and they tried to sell them to the passerbys. And on average, people were willing to pay a nickel. What does that mean? When you make it yourself, you feel a connection to it and therefore you want to hold on to it, and therefore you overvalue it, and you think that it's worth more than it really is. He says they even went and they had like a display case where they had professional origami there, and they also had the stuff that the people made themselves, but they didn't tell them, this is your stuff that you made, this is your paper frog, and then they asked them like to rate them, and they thought that the frogs were just as good as the items that were made by the professional origami makers. Again, proving this point that when you make something yourself, you become invested in it, and you tend to think that it's worth more than it really is. Now, what does this have to do with Purim? I'm not sure, but Parsha's Truma does have to do with it. So in this week's Parsha, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Zuchron of Racha, has a beautiful idea. He starts out by saying like this. He says that we have in this week the mitzvah to build the Mishkan. Now, what's the Mishkan? It's this temporary Beis Hamikdash. It's only a traveling version of the Beis Hamikdash. Once we get to Israel, we get settled in Israel, we're gonna get the real deal. But nevertheless, we have so many details. Truma Tetzav, we have all these commandments. Make this, make this, make this. Oh, the clothing of the Kohen Gadol next week. This is how you make this, this is how you make this. And then, by Yakel Pekude, we review everything that we spoke about in Truma Tetzav. And we say the commandment to make the Aram, they did it. They made the Aram. The commandment to make the Menorah, they did it. They made... We go through everything with so much detail. He says, why? And perhaps a stronger question is he says, what book are we in now? We're in the book of Shmos. Now, if we needed to think what the book of Shmos is about, so our knee-jerk reaction would be Exodus. Okay, but like if we had to give it a subtitle, so you would say it's the birth of a nation. This is when the Jewish people, they started out, they went down to Mitzrayim as a family, 70 people, they leave, they leave as a nation, and then ultimately they go to Mount Sinai, they receive the Torah, and then the next parsha, Mishpatim tells you the mitzvahs that they got there. That would be a great closing point. What's the next book? Vayikra. That's Leviticus. That's all about what you do in the Beis HaMikdash. All the sacrifices that are brought. Where are those sacrifices brought? In the Mishkan. In the tabernacle. So you would think that it should all go together. The whole story of the Mishkan, how you build it, and when you build it, and where you build it, that should all be in the next book, in Vayikra. Why is it here in Shmos? It seems like it doesn't belong here. So he says a fascinating idea. He says that when the Jews were there in Mitzrayim, and then they leave Egypt, and they're in the desert, so they witness miracle after miracle after miracle. So they see the ten plagues, right? Box seats. They get to see everything that's happening. They come to the Red Sea. They see the sea split. They start fetching about water. Hashem says, Moshe, take a stick. Wow, they got water. They say, we're hungry. Hashem sends them on. But we want meat. No problem. They get quail. Everything that they complain about, Hashem provides for them. What's the result? They complain even more. And the complaints, they're terrible. When you think about it, right? Imagine they're sitting there at the Red Sea and they see the Egyptians coming towards them and they look at Moshe and they say like this. They say, They say, okay, so this is the way that we're assessing the situation. The cemeteries in Egypt were rather full 
And if we would die in Egypt, there wouldn't be room to bury all of us. So Hashem said, I'm going to bring 10 plagues, take them out of Egypt, and then they could die here in the desert. This way it won't fill up the cemeteries in Egypt. Right? You listen to such a thing and you say, boy, do they need a slap, right? How dare you talk that way? This is the result of watching 10 plagues and you say, Hashem, and it just gets worse and worse. No matter what's going on, Hashem keeps on giving, but they don't get it. They, they, keep on, they keep on complaining. Parenthetically, there's a famous joke that, uh, that the Jewish Jews are around for 4,000 years and Chinese civilization is only around for 3,000 years. So that being the case, we have to wonder what we ate for 1,000 years. Rabbi Sachs actually says that it happened to him, that a Chinese person came to him and he asked him the question. And he said, what did you guys eat for 1,000 years? So he said to him, obviously you don't know the Bible. They were always complaining about the food. <laughs> But, but anyways, so he says, what happens? They're always kvetching, they're always complaining, and nothing is happening. So Hashem realizes, or perhaps wants to teach us a very important lesson. What does he want to teach us? If I give, and I give, and I give, it's not going to change you. I'm going to give you more, I'm going to give you more, and what's going to be the result of that? You're never going to be happy. You're going to keep on asking for more and more. So Hashem does something which he doesn't need. Hashem doesn't need a home. What does Hashem say? Ko amar Hashem, Hashemayim. Kisi, the Haaretz, Hadon Raglai. I have a throne. My throne is in the heaven. I, I don't need a house down here on earth. And if I did, I could make it myself. I don't need you to make it for me. But Hashem asks us to make it. Why? Because He wants to make us partners. He, he wants to teach us a very important lesson. If we feel like we're contributing, then we don't have that sense of dependency. We feel like we're contributing. We're now a partner with Hashem. If we can be a partner with Hashem, we can give Hashem then we're going to feel so much closer to Hashem because we're not only receiving, we're also giving. So Hashem sends out this message and what happens? The Jews come running, they bring gold, they bring silver, they bring animal skins, they bring oil, they bring their time, their effort, their talents. And when all this is going on, we have no record of any complaining. He gives them this project that they should work on together. Because as Dan Ariely says, when you invest in an item, it doesn't change the item. After everything is said and done, the item is the same item. What does it change? It changes you. You become better. Or you look at it differently. So in this case, Hashem wanted us to stop fighting. He wanted us to stop complaining. So He gives us a chance to contribute. And that's what the Mishkan is all about. It's all about giving us a chance to feel like we're contributing. And when we feel like we're contributing, then we'll have a greater appreciation of what the relationship is. He says that on Shabbos davening, we say at the end of uh, Enkel Okeinu, right before Aleinu, so we quote there a Pasik, um, Rav Shalom Banayich, and then it says, on a level of Jewish, Al Tikre Banayich, Ela Bonayich. Don't read it as children, but read it as builders. So he says, what does that mean? Don't read it as children, but read it as builders. So says there by Sachs, if you want your children to grow up and not stay children, then you have to give them a chance to build. You have to give them a chance to contribute. Otherwise, if you don't, then they're, they're always going to stay children. If you want it to be able to develop, to mature, give them a chance to feel like they're doing something, like they're contributing towards this. And that's the greatest favor that you could give them because now they feel a part of it. He ends with just one last thought. And he says that there's this expression, which is a little bit of a funny expression. We talk about making Shabbos. And he says, uh, the truth is that based on the bracha, we say Hashem makes Shabbos. Bracha to Hashem, mekadesh Shabbos. Hashem is the one that sanctifies the Shabbos. So why do we say that we make Shabbos? So he says that the idea was that we wanted to feel a chilek. We wanted to feel a connection, a portion together with the Shabbos. So that's why the rabbis went and Shabbos, we have so many decrees, right? Hashem says that you're not allowed to write with a pen on Shabbos. But the rabbis come to the rabbis and say, no, no, should you not write with a pen? Don't even move the pen, muksa. So they keep on adding. Why are they adding? Because they're contributing. They're giving their contribution towards Shabbos. He says, perhaps even now where we don't have all these gezeras, all these new decrees that the rabbis are adding, but every generation, they add a Shabbos food. They had a Shabbos song. They composed a new song for Shabbos, a new poem for Shabbos. Why? Because they want to feel that we're partners in the Shabbos. So it's a little bit dangerous because we know that there's this idea of kochi v'otzim yali. When a person contributes, sometimes he might think that it's not I'm contributing with the help of God. I'm contributing because uh, I have the power to do it. So you have to realize where it's coming from. But when you keep that balance and you realize that the reason why you're able to contribute is because Hashem allowed you. But nevertheless, you are being allowed to do it yourself 
that you can contribute, then this gives you that sense of accomplishment, and that is what allows us to grow as a nation and to no longer have all of that complaining. Hashakor. Hashakor.